Hi everyone, this is GKCS. Today we are talking about the master-slave architecture and what I'm going to be doing is talking about a scenario which ends up with us using the master-slave architecture to solve the problem, right? And this is the problem. The problem is that we have four cell phones, as you can see, and you have a load balancer which is going to be redirecting these requests from the cell phones to our servers. Now, this is a very common diagram, so to speak, in interviews that people draw lots of servers, but they have just one database. So whenever you see a single thing like this load balancer or this database, the first thing that should strike you is that this is a single point of failure. So when you're seeing a database, it can crash. Now, if it does crash, then your business stops because everything, all the requests depend on data in the servers, uh, which is being pulled from the databases basically. So to avoid that kind of a problem, there's many things you can do, but the simplest solution, so to speak, is just to replicate the data that you have in that database and store it somewhere else, right? Just have a copy. So that's what we're gonna do. We are just gonna make a copy. This copy is preferably stored in some other hardware component. Yeah, because if that hardware crashes, then you shouldn't have the copy also crashing. So I'm assuming that it's in some other RAID card. So now that you have this copy, how are you going to pull data from this original database? There's two ways, mainly synchronously or asynchronously. If it is asynchronously, the good thing is there's not too much load on the database over here. You know, there's not somebody continuously asking for an update every time there is an update on the original database. So that's one advantage. One disadvantage of that is it's going to be out of sync. Yeah, that's what asynchronously means. So um, if there is a transaction, let's say in the original one in this database, it may not reflect in this one before it crashes. So in that case, you're going to have some sort of inconsistent data, but maybe that's okay. Maybe you can do, uh, you can deal with that. So asynchronous is good for you. If you can't, then you're looking for something called synchronous copies. The thing with synchronous copies is, you know, there's no such thing as a synchronous copy, so to speak, unless it's enforced by human beings through code. What's going to happen is, whenever there's an update on the original database, it's going to be sending a message to this guy over here that, hey, I got an update. And in your transaction log, you can make this change. You can add this command. So for example, add 100 to user ID one is a command that the master got. Yeah. Finally, we're getting to the technical terms. This is the master and this is the slave. You can probably guess the kind of roles that they have. So the master gets the command and it sends it to the slave to be copied. So all the slave needs at any point of time is a command and it can just rerun this command to have the same consistent state as the master because all the commands are the same and in the same serial order. That's an assumption that I'm making here. Here's an interesting thought. What if one of the servers wants to update the slave? So S3 sends an update command to the slave. I'm going to be adding 200 rupees to user ID two. If this is the case, the slave needs a way to tell the master that there's a change and that has to be propagated upwards. There's two ways to solve this problem. Uh, and the first way is to just ignore the problem or to just never let the problem happen. So uh, the way you can do that is to never allow write operations to come over here. Yeah. So this operation is impossible. The slave never gets any write operations. It just copies data. The second thing you can do is actually allow this, allow that add 200 to user ID two and propagate this to the master. In this case, the slave has actually taken over the role of the master uh, and it's no longer a, a master-slave relation, but it's a peer-to-peer -peer relation, in which case both of them are masters. The key point here is that the master is the only person who can take write operations. So any, any database copy which is taking in write operations is a master. So over here we have a master-master architecture. Now in a master-master architecture, what's going to happen is you will have some propagation like we said, so there's going to be back and forth between the two nodes. Now this seems really nice. It feels like these two databases are equal and uh, you know there's write operations happening on both of them. So there is some load balancing on the write operations also. Uh, and the best thing about this feels uh, that, you know, it, it, what happens if this database crashes? No problem, everyone can redirect their requests to this database. Uh, and if this one crashes, then of course they can do vice versa. And so it seems like a very resilient and strong system. Uh, however, there's a problem. Uh, and the problem is in a distributed system, nothing is sure because of the network partition thing, now, because of communication can fail. So if A and B 
are both masters and they talk to each other and they make sure that they are in sync. If B fails, our assumption is that A will take up the role uh, of the entire database, right? What happens if B has not failed, but the router between them has failed? Yeah, they were sending a message. Uh, this router had some issue. So now they're unable to send messages to each other. In this case, A assumes that I'm the master. I know everything about the world. So I'm going to be accepting read and write operations and that's okay. And that's exactly what B also assumes. You know, B thinks that I'm the master, I'm going to be taking read and write operations. And you know what's going to happen over here. Um, if user, user X sends a message to deduct 100 rupees from their account, uh, and then they send another message over here to deduct 50 rupees from their account. And let's assume that they have a balance of 120. So in a balance of 120, they actually deducted 150. So they actually went into negative balance. This problem is called the split brain problem. Yeah, when you split your brain. <laughs> Interestingly, the split brain problem can be solved by adding a third node to the original architecture. So A and B had problems with the split brain. Uh, if you add in C, then you can solve the problem, so to speak. Uh, it's just that it's based on an assumption. Uh, and the assumption is this, that the chance of a node crashing and the router between the other two nodes crashing is highly, highly unlikely. So we're going to assume it never happens. So what could possibly happen? Uh, if C crashes, then A and B are masters and they are staying in sync. They are sending messages to each other and making sure that the world is in a consistent state for the two of them. So that's fine. And when C comes back up, they can read from A or B. When the link between A and B goes down, which is the basis of the split brain problem, what happens? A gets a write request. So that sends the state of A into, let's say, X. Uh, it propagates the state to C. It tries to propagate the C, uh, state to B, but it's not, it's not allowed. So initially the state is S0, S0 and S0. It moves to state X. So now the state is SX. And over here, the state has moved to SX. B gets a write operation. Its state moves to SY. It tries to propagate the state to C, but that doesn't happen. The reason it doesn't happen is because C says, what's your previous state? So from S0, it went to SY. Uh, C sees that this is, this is not the same state as I am in, which is SX. And what it can say is, hey B, you need to update your state. You need to update your state to this, and then you can have a successful transaction. So then B's transaction can fail, and instead of moving to SY, it rolls it back. It's a rollback on the transaction and it syncs up with SX, right? And at this point, what can happen is the user is fine. The transaction did not go through, so that's expected. Uh, and they can send the request again with the newer state SX. B can then run the transaction, reach a state SY, ask C to go there. And now A, when it gets a new transaction, let's say sending it to SZ, can have the same procedure with it. There's lots of interesting scenarios here, of course. What happens if B sends a request to C to update itself and it crashes with the, with the newer state? Well, it can't have this state permanently because it's a transaction. It can roll it back before it's committed. So, uh, only after uh, all other nodes have actually committed the transaction can you call this to be the state of this node. So I've just used it for representational purposes. The other thing you can think here is that A can never make a transaction which doesn't have the updated state from B also because that is being propagated by C and we are assuming that either one router or one node fails. You know, two things don't happen at the same time. As you can see, this is heading into the land of distributed consensus. And I'll be speaking on this when you guys uh, vote for this topic. So take your time <laughs> and there's other topics also, but yeah, we can speak on this when you like. Uh, distributed consensus is a way in which multiple nodes agree on a particular value. And that's what's happening over here. B, A, and C are agreeing at the final state, which is SY. Right. Uh, and there's many protocols you have for distributed consensus. Uh, I have tried to simplify it over here. Uh, there's, if you have lots of nodes, then 2PC is a very popular protocol. Although there's some serious drawbacks here that it's really slow. Two-phase commit, you can read up on that. Uh, there's three-phase commit. One interesting uh, protocol which I really like is MVCC, uh, which is multi-version concurrency control. It's a long name, but it's used by Postgres. The good thing about MVCC is that, as you can see, multi-version. That means that it keeps 
multiple versions of the same data. So if I send multiple update commands on the same data, it keeps multiple copies. Yeah. Uh, the reason for this is that depending on your requirement, uh, it behaves in a certain way. So if you're okay with dirty reads, then it's going to keep an older version of the data and someone can go and read it. But if you say that, no, I want really nice serializable reads, no phantom reads and all that, then it's going to, of course, make it slower, but it's going to ensure that that data is consistent with everything else. Okay, it might be heavy uh, to understand, so, but have a look at MVCC, it's a really nice way to uh, get some sort of lock on the data. Another interesting uh, protocol used by Microsoft for the game Halo is Saga. Yeah, this is Saga, as you can think of, is a long transaction. So it's like a long story. I'll give you a few examples on Saga. Um, let's say you have a food ordering app and a person makes an order. Now the restaurant has not actually agreed on that order. So the transaction is not really complete, so to speak. Uh, they may not have withdrawn the funds. What they want to do is lock your funds. So if you have made an order for 200 rupees, they go to your bank and say, lock these 200 rupees uh, from my customer. And till I get a confirmation, I'm actually not going to withdraw this money. Uh, if the transaction fails, then I'm going to just keep the money. You know, you don't need to go through the whole transaction process and settlements at the end of the day and everything. This is one use case. Uh, the second use case is if you have a phone app, right? Uh, and a person makes a call. So you need to charge the person. But the thing is, it might last for 30 minutes. So you can break it into smaller transactions of one minute each in which you are, you're not going to charge the customer, but you're going to lock funds every minute, a little more and a little more. And at the end of the thing, you're going to decide whether the call is a failure or a success. And based on that, you're going to charge the customer. Okay, so that's a saga, a really long transaction, which at any point can fail and you may need to roll it back. Okay, uh, interesting concept. We'll be talking about that when we do get to distribute consensus. I think I'm really pushing very hard for this topic now. Now, enough of all the negative things that we can think about in the master-slave architecture, uh, why would you ever go for this kind of an architecture? The first reason is that you have this nice replica of the data, so that's backup. The second thing is that you can scale out your read operations. So if you have to do some sort of analytics, you don't really care about real time so much, you can keep pulling uh, data from the master to the slave, and then you can run some sort of an analytics engine through the data. Another good thing over here is that you can add many slaves. You can add maybe 10 slaves, 20 slaves, and just do read operations on all of them. So if your data is not critical, let's say Facebook, you know, you're adding a comment. It doesn't really matter if it doesn't reflect immediately. I mean, it reflects on the master, but the slaves will take some time to get that data. You can make read operations on the slaves uh, and basically scale out based on uh, how many slaves you add to that one master. And the final thing you can do to mitigate this problem is to uh, use a concept called sharding. There's a video I made on that, you can check it out. Through sharding, what you're doing is you're breaking down your responsibilities to particular nodes. So A is going to be handling users from zero to 100, B is going to be handling users from 100 to 200, C is going to be handling users from 200 to all the way around to zero. So it goes up to 300 and then basically hits zero. What you're effectively doing is you're reducing the range of the damage that you can have if one of the nodes fail. So if node C fails, uh, then all the users between 200 and 300 are affected. To mitigate that, we can actually have a slave over here, which will take up the role of a master when C crashes. So you have some sort of coordinator over here. When C crashes, it points to C's slave, which becomes the new master. And then you can try to bring this node back up or add another node, depending on what the requirement is. But uh, what you have done effectively is using some sort of a two PC protocol, you can make sure that these two are in sync with each other always. And if there is one node failure, your system will still work fine. So as you can see, there's lots of algorithms and a lot of thinking which goes behind making these systems reliable, scalable and everything else. Um, if you're looking for system design for your interviews, you're probably also looking for a refresher course on your algorithms. And here's the point when I actually place a product on my video. Uh, this is Algo Expert. It's actually extremely good. More than anything, if you are looking for a slightly senior role, but also have some sort of algorithms to answer, this is a really good product. I actually went through the questions that they have. There are 65 handpicked ones, and they also have uh, lots of explanations for each of these questions, which includes the coding and the whiteboard explanations. The price for this is $65 uh, either once or $20 a month. So it depends on how much you can cram in, but my suggestion would be if you do have some cash, then go for the $65 option. 
Oh yeah, by the way, it's not 65 if you're going through this channel because you will be getting 30% off. So that turns out to be 45.5 USD. That's the discounted price you get if you use the promo code Gaurav. So there's a link in the description below, of course, explaining the, the pricing and everything else about Algo Expert. The main thing I want to say is that I really like this site. That's it on the master slave architecture. Uh, I'm sure you have lots of doubts and suggestions, so you can leave them in the comments below. I'll answer as many as I can. Uh, I take a poll every week for what do you want to see next. So uh, I'll be putting that in the community tab and you can vote for what you want to see next as the video. Of course, if you like this video, then hit the like button. And if you want notifications for further videos, hit the subscribe button. I'll see you next time.